Tonight I'll be discussing the life and times of the last of the great samurai. He was the last warrior to truly embody the ideas of Bushido in the samurai code. He had the sickest eyebrows of any man who has ever lived. This is the story of Saigo Takamori. Saigo Takamori was born on January 23rd, 1828, in the city of Kagoshima, capital of the province, Satsuma. He was the eldest of seven children. His father was a low-ranking official who, despite his position as a samurai and a civil servant, barely made enough money to feed his large family. The family is so destitute that Saigo and his seven siblings shared the same small bamboo cot throughout his childhood. His parents were often forced to borrow large sums of money in order to maintain their ancestral farmland so that they could cultivate food to feed the family. Saigo and his siblings often went hungry. His initial experiences with poverty and the work associated with farming gave him an appreciation for simple living and hard work throughout his life. At age six, Saigo began attending a goju in a nearby village. Gojus were in essence elementary schools for samurai. After joining the academy, he received his first wakizashi. Wakizashis were short swords that were popular among samurai warriors. Saigo performed much better as a scholar than a warrior in his elementary school, excelling in academics rather than combat. He graduated from the school at age 14 and was introduced to the rulers of Satsuma in 1841. Three years later, at age 17, he began working as an agricultural advisor for the local government. His experience of farming made him a great advisor for the Satsuma bureaucrats. Saigo married Ijuin Suga, the daughter of a powerful samurai, in an arranged marriage in 1852. Shortly after the wedding, Saigo's parents passed away, leaving Saigo to provide for his siblings and his own family with a small income. Less than two years after their marriage, Saigo and his wife broke up. Saigo's fortune when sued changed for the better. In 1854, he became the assistant for a portent daimyo named Shimazu Nakiara, representative for Saigo's homeland. He accompanied the lord on a trip to Edo by foot. The trip between the island of Kyushu and the capital city of Edo was a nearly 900 mile long journey. When the daimyo and Saigo arrived in Edo, Saigo began work as a gardener for the emperor's palace. The gardening job allowed Saigo to work as a spy for Daimyo Nakiara. Saigo performed well as a spy and soon became Nakiara's closest advisor. Saigo contained a network on his lord's behalf, often consulting with other political leaders on a plan to increase the emperor's power and reduce the power of the individual petty kingdoms that controlled Japan. Unfortunately, Saigo's mentor Daimyo Nakiara died suddenly in the morning of July 15, 1858. Many of the leaders who were allied with old daimyo suspected that he had been poisoned by a rival. In that time period, it was common for samurai to accompany their masters in death. Saigo seriously contemplated Bushido, or not aliving himself, but a local Buddhist monk named Yesho persuaded Saigo that he needed to live and honor the old daimyo's memory by continuing his political work. Saigo reluctantly agreed, actively campaigning to unify Japan as one nation. However, Powerful shoguns began actively purging pro-imperial citizens, and the Buddhist monk was on their hit list. Saigo and the monk fled back to Satsuma, narrowly escaping death at the hands of the shogun's troops. When they arrived, the new daimyo, who was the brother-in-law of Saigo's dead master, refused to protect the two men. Soon, shogunate troops arrived and surrounded Saigo and Gesho. The two men escaped by jumping off a cliff on the island into Kagoshima Bay. Saigo was then picked up by a fishing boat and escaped successfully. Unfortunately, his friend Gesho drowned and was not able to be revived by the crew of the boat. Saigo mourned the loss of his friend. He then spent the next three years in exile on the tiny island of Amamiyoshima, far to the south of the main Japanese island. Saigo also changed his last name to Suzuki. Soon after the shogun stopped their search, declaring that Saigo was dead. Surviving remnants of pro-imperialist groups still existed at Edo, and many men who continued to believe in a united Japan wrote Saigo for advice in politics. Saigo gave sage advice for the loyalists, and he continued to make an impact in Kyoto despite his exile and status as a dead man. By the year 1861, Saigo was a well-respected part of the island community. He was very popular with the islanders and had become a local school teacher 
who was the favorite of many of the children in the island due to his kindness. Saigo married a local wo woman named Agiana and fathered a son. Unfortunately, this brief period of calm would end when Saigo was called back to Satsuma in February 1862. Despite his past grievances with the new Satsuma daimyo, who had refused to let Saigo enter the island the last time they had met, Saigo made peace with him. The ruler wanted to make amends and permitted Saigo to travel through his kingdom to Edo. Saigo soon arrived at the emperor's court in March 1862. Many of his former enemies treated him with a new respect after hearing about how he had sacrificed his position as an advisor to help the monk Gesho. However, one of the lords saw him as a threat and had him arrested and deported to another small island. After all, why not send a man who enjoys living on islands to another small island? They should have built a wall. Saigo's exile ended in 1864. He returned to the mainland and was elected head of the Satsuma army under Daimyo Hisamitsu. Politics had changed while Saigo was in exile. Pro-emperor members of the government had finally chosen to speak up, with many calling for an end to the shogunate. Unfortunately, many of them sought to bar foreigners from entering Japan or planned to kick any foreigners living in Japan out of the country. These same radicals claimed that the Japanese gods were angry at the presence of foreign people, and the gods would help fight the western invaders. Saigo still advocated for a centralized system of governance instead of a divided nation of petty lords. However, he strongly distrusted the radicals who were campaigning for the expulsion and even death of western merchants and missionaries. Rebellions broke out all over the country in support of the radicals. Japan's shoguns were unable to put down the uprisings, and it was clear that the rulers were too weak to stay in power. Saigo decided to ally the radicals, as he still valued the idea of Japan being ruled by the emperor. He led a campaign against the province of Choshu. The Choshu army had recently opened fire on an imperial fortress in Kyoto. Saigo, at the head of a massive army, marched on the province's capital. He cho chose to negotiate peace with the Choshu, resulting in a bloodless victory for his forces. The fact that Saigo had managed to capture a city without any bloodshed won him national fame. Meanwhile, the shoguns had become increasingly cruel to their people as they attempted to hold the existing domains together. The 35-year-old emperor suddenly passed away in December 1866, with his young son Mutashito taking the throne. The tension between the shoguns and the reformers continued to grow worse. In 1867, Saigo made plans with the Choshu and Tosa governments to bring down the martial rule of the shoguns. Their plans culminated in the Boshin War. The first battle was to happen on January 3, 1868. Saigo led an army of 5,000 men into battle against the armies of the shoguns. Saigo's disciplined soldiers were faced by an army three times their size equipped with heavy artillery. In the end, Saigo's troops routed the untrained opposing forces. By the summer, Saigo's army was able to surround Edo, forcing the shogun-led government to surrender. Saigo made waves in Japan when he allowed the enemy commander to keep his head. In Japan, it was custom to behead a defeated leader. At the conclusion of the Boshin War, Saigo took a much-needed rest, retiring back home to be with his family. He was soon called by the new government to be advisor to the Satsuma Lord. Massive reforms took place in the government, Flam being stripped from the richer samurai and rewarded to some of the lower ranking warriors. A new system was put in place, allowing samurai to be promoted based on their talent instead of their rank. Modern technologies were implemented, despite light opposition from the radicals, modern industries were actively encouraged by the government. In 1871, a call was put out to form a united military to protect the newly formed Japan. Saigo was assigned the task of organizing the new national army. In July 1871, the Meiji government called the remaining daimyo to Tokyo, the renamed capital of Japan. A decree was made abolishing the ancient domains of the lords and stripping them of their titles and powers. Saigo was unhappy about these changes. He had hoped the new government would still keep some of these older traditions. He had anticipated the abrupt shift as the old system was torn apart. Soon after the decree, the government announced that they would begin conscription, with volunteers replacing the samurai warriors. At the same time, a crisis had arisen between the new Japanese emperor and the rulers of Korea. 
The Korean dynasty refused to acknowledge Mutashito as emperor, stating that they only recognized the Chinese emperor as a true descendant of the gods. They even insulted Japan's industry, calling Japan a deplorable nation of barbarians for adopting Western customs. The Japanese military was triggered. Many of the hawks in the army and navy still call for an invasion of Korea. Saigo, as was typical of his personality, argued for a peaceful settlement instead of a show of force. He believed that they should only attack Korea if it sought to attack them. He requested to be sent to Korea as an emissary, but the new prime minister rejected Saigo's proposal. Saigo resigned as the commander of the army of Japan the next day, disgusted that the other government leaders would allow him to look for a more peaceful path to Korea. Over 46 other people in the military resigned along with him. In the end, Japan decided to provoke Korea and start a war. In 1875, a Japanese warship sailed into the waters near Korean artillery battery. The Korean artillery opened fire on the warship, injuring and killing some of the crew. This allowed the Japanese to claim that the Koreans had opened fire on their military. They then forced the Korean emperor to sign a peace treaty. The treaty was intentionally biased allowing the Japanese to annex Korea soon after. Saigo is disgusted by the underhanded tactics used to expand the new Japanese empire. Saigo was unhappy with the nation's leaders, but he was enjoying a comfortable retirement, was quite happy to be out politics for a while. He spent most of his time playing with his grandchildren, fishing, hunting, and spending time in the hot springs on his native island. However, he was still upset that the ancient ways of the samurai and the path of Bushido were being left behind. Many former samurai in Satsuma shared his dislike for the empiricism of the Meiji. Several of his old friends approached him, asking if he would help them fight the current government. He refused. Saigo sought to establish a new series of samurai schools to continue the ancient Japanese traditions. He called these schools Shigako, the Japanese word for private school. Young Satsumans learned modern infantry and artillery tactics, along with classic Confucian texts and Japanese works about the way of the samurai. Saigo provided the funding for these schools, but did not control the curriculum. Unbeknownst to him, many of the young men were being taught to hate the Meiji government and its western leanings. The samurai's distrust of the rulers turned into an open rebellion when the Meiji banned samurai from carrying their weapons and stopped offering st stipends in 1876. When the government chose to remove the privileges offered by being a warrior, they alienated the samurai class. Samurai started protests all over Japan in response. Saigo quietly cheered them on, but stayed at his country estate. He grew concerned that if he chose to go to the capital, his presence would start another bloody rebellion. As tensions between the government and the warriors grew, the Meiji unwisely chose to send ships to seize the weapons of the armory in Kagoshima. Kagoshima had a rich history as a center of samurai culture. The armory, armory had provided weapons for Satsuma warriors for countless generations. Satsuma was pretty much a Japanese Texas. The students of the Shigako heard that a ship was being sent. On the nights leading up to the arrival of the fleet, the students snuck into arsenals throughout Kagoshima, stealing arms and ammunition. They also discovered that the national police had sent spies to infiltrate the school. They quickly located the traitors, and after interrogating the spies, uncovered a plot to kill Saigo. If the government's clumsy attempts to put down the samurai hadn't already angered Saigo, the fact that they had tried to kill him through the most cowardly way possible definitely did. Saigo was very angry, but he did not want to rebel, as he still had his sense of deep loyalty to the emperor. On the day after the uncovering of the plot, Saigo announced that he would go to Tokyo to question the leaders of the government. Over 12,000 Satsuman men, armed with rifles, pistols, and other weapons, set out with him, declaring that they would back him up. The men marched more north confidently, so they were sure that the other samurai left in the southern provinces would rally with them. The opposite occurred. The rebels faced an army of 45,000 imperial conscripts and trench around Kumamoto Castle north of Satsuma. The rebel forces were stuck in a several-month-long siege at the castle. They soon exhausted their ammo, with many of Saigo's men switching back to their swords. Saigo began to realize that his smaller army could not possibly break through the fortress. He was not bothered. He stated that he would welcome the opportunity to die for his principles. 
Soon after, the rebels were forced to retreat, with many of the fleeing samurai picked off by Imperial troops. At the end, Saigo was left with just 300 surviving men. He chose to make his last stand at Shiroyama Mountain near the city of Kagoshima. In the early morning of September 24th, 1877, Saigo and his 300 men made one final charge against a force of 7,000 Imperial troops in the Battle of Shiroyama. Saigo was shot through the femur during the charge and died shortly after. One of his companions cut off his head hit it from the enemy troops in a gesture to preserve his, armor, his honor. Imperial troops located his body and head after the battle and gave him a proper burial. This final battle concluded the incredible story of Saigo's life. Saigo's life as a warrior and a politician symbolized what was happening to Japan in the late 19th century. His life had as many twists and turns as a soap opera. Saigo was a maverick. He fought the old shoguns in the new, newly unified Japan that he helped create. He was a warrior raised in a traditional setting. He wanted to balance his homeland's ancient traditions with the innovations of the rest of the world. In the end, he succeeded in helping make modern Japan. However, he also contributed to the downfall of the shoguns and samurai. Saigo did his best to bridge both worlds, and in the end, the modern world won out. He died seeking to keep the old traditions alive. In his final battle, he led his men in traditional charge that was common for feudal Japan, clenching a sword and exemplifying the self-sacrifice called for by Bushido. He ended up dying from a bullet instead of from a wound made by a samurai's weapon. Saigo's character in his life represents modern Japan, a nation that still holds true tradition that seeks to be clever and innovative as well. Saigo's the blueprint for old school progressives, a person who values, understands, and holds to the traditions of their country while still seeking to improve their surroundings. I personally believe that we should be like Saigo, appreciating the honorable traditions of our past while optimistically looking towards the future.